Welcome to NSTA Podcasts. In this segment, Joe Krejcik will talk about argumentation in the next generation science standards. What we're going to do now is back up and just think a little bit about the next generation of science standards. So see how those three dimensions that Ted mentioned initially uh, at the beginning and how they all fit together. So one of the things that the standards says that, that I'm sorry, the framework very clear, clearly points out is that standards have to emphasize all three of those dimensions, the cross-cutting concepts, the disciplinary core ideas, and the engineering and scientific practices. And what comes from that is that is this, the notion of performance expectations. And what performance expectations really do is specify how kids should make use of that knowledge in terms of a performance. So they could, that's the, one of the major differences that actually exist in this version of, uh, that came out of the framework, that we want to have standards actually specifying how kids should use knowledge. And one of the ways they could use knowledge, of course, is in terms of arguments. But it's not the only way. They can make, the, make use of it by applying many of the other practices. So here, uh, what I have in front of you is an example of how the, these performance expectations, which will be the next generation of standards, have actually been developed. So we, you can, in some respects, you can start with a cross-cutting, you, know, you can start with a core idea, which is you'll see on the left side of your screen right there. This is, uh, in fact, a core idea taking from the grade band endpoint uh, for uh, the nature of matter. And it literally talks about uh, that all substances are made up of atoms and that these atoms form molecules. And of course, there's liquids and gases, et cetera. And the way you get these performance uh, expectations is you cross them, you might say, I like to use the word cross, with a cross-cutting concept. In this case, it's patterns. And of course, since today we're talking about arguments, I'm crossing it with the practice of constructing arguments using evidence. And when you do that, you end up with a performance expectation. And like Ted's case, this is a made-up performance expectation. Uh, but it says, it's not actually one of the ones in the standards, but it's close. Construct an argument to defend the claim that the motion of molecules changes as the temperature increases. So we see a blend of making use of a practice, which is how we want the students, what's the, that's the performance that I want the kids to be able to do. And it's crossed with the core idea. And of course, the pattern in, in this particular case is almost, uh, it's assumed because the only way we could actually, this happens because this is a pattern that always occurs when uh, the temperature changes. And here, here are some performance expectations using examples of performance expectations. This has been modified uh, for the purposes of, of this presentation, but they go across both elementary, middle school, and high school. So I'll, I'll look closely at the elementary one here. Construct an argument using evidence to support a claim about the relationship between the change in motion and the change in energy of an object. So once again, we see this blend of a practice with a core idea, and that's knowledge and use. And so you can, when the standards are released, or when the next version is released, uh, or if you looked at these previously, you'll see that all of these are written in terms of this fashion, that we want kids to be able to make use of the core ideas with a particular practice. So uh, I certainly want you to come away uh, from this session with a much richer understanding of argument. But if you come away with one idea, I actually, another idea, this is the one I want you to come away with, is that that we can't, we, in the future, or hopefully in the past, we can't treat content and inquiry separately. These things are actually integrally linked together to help kids form knowledge or form understanding. And I like this analogy of this rope, because 
when we use this analogy of a rope, it symbolizes that it's much stronger than just one of these single strands. So we really want to have kids who can develop understanding that's really rich and that they can apply in their daily lives to solve problems. We have to get them in involved in using these practices and arguments blended with the cross-cutting concepts and the core idea. And that's a very different approach to what, uh, to what we've done previously in classrooms. Often, and unfortunately, in some respects, our focus has been here on, I'm sorry, not there, here on core ideas. And not on this blending of the three together. So, I, you know, as we move forward in our teaching, we have to actually blend these three things together. In this case of argument, it's when kids make claims, we have to always, as a teacher, say, what's your evidence for that? What's your reasoning? Are there other possible explanations? So the standard also um, makes use of this other really powerful idea, and that learning just doesn't happen in isolation. Learning actually uh, happens over time as students construct and rework ideas. And I mention that is because if we really want kids to develop this rich understanding of argument, it has to be done over time. It has to start, this is not just for the high school students, high school students, this is as much for the kids in first grade, in, in fourth grade, in seventh grade, as it is for kids in high school. That we all have to work together through the years to actually help them develop much richer understanding. And so this idea of learning develops over time is that kids will form much deeper understanding as we get them, to, get them involved in these tasks, like using arguments that force them actually to say, what's my evidence and what's my reasoning for this? And of course, this last bullet that I have on this slide, it says developing this understanding is dependent on instruction. This isn't just going to happen. It really depends on what you and what we do in our classrooms. And that goes just as much for me as it does for you. Uh, since I'm responsible for helping develop uh, future teachers, I certainly have to provide them with that kind of instruction as well. So here's just an example of what this designing instruction might look, over, uh, look, look like over time. You can see kids in second grade might make a claim and use evidence. As they get a little bit older, uh, they can certainly uh, construct scientific evidence, drawing on evidence or a model, but also taking into consideration other ideas. Does this fit all ideas out there? As kids perhaps uh, progress to middle school, they can certainly present both oral and written arguments. Again, this is really supporting a lot of their literacy skills. But again, supporting those, arg those uh, arguments by empirical evidence and reasoning, and then refuting other possible explanations. And then in high school, we would certainly want kids to begin to bring up counter arguments based upon uh, evidence and challenging other possible proposed arguments. Uh, so this, in fact, this is the, uh, what we would hope to see all high schools, all students who graduate from our schools be able to do with respect to arguments. This is actually part uh, taken directly from the framework document. Uh, and what we, what all kids who leave our schools should be able to do, which is construct a scientific argument showing how the data support a claim, identify possible weaknesses in scientific arguments of other uh, scientific arguments using appropriate level of knowledge and evidence, identify flaws in their own arguments, and be able to modify those, uh, their own arguments uh, in response to criticisms, recognize that the major features of arguments are this claim, data, and reasoning, and distinguish these elements and examples, and of course, be able to apply this stuff as they read uh, media reports. <music>